Hello everybody and welcome to another video where I read the forum posts on the future of the fortress Q&A that Tarn does at the beginning of every month. I usually give myself until the 5th to get these done, I'm currently recording this all on the 3rd, I did all of the prep work for the video yesterday, so we're pretty much on time I say. And uh, fortunately for me, I won't be sweating the entire time this one, because uh, it's not ridiculously hot outside and I don't have to turn my air conditioning off to be able to record a video without you hearing brrrr in the background, which is what would have happened in the last one if I hadn't done that. So this recording process is going to be a lot more pleasant for me, that's irrelevant to you, but let's get started. The first one we have here is from Mobstar, and they ask, Are dwarves from other civs meant to join player fortresses? They just show up at there and quietly declare themselves a member of a different nation. Are there alliances or visa via war, refu re war refugees? Uh, and then Tarn's response is, So it looks like it pulls historical migrants from the player's civ only, unless they are vampires, which of course, you know, can just break the rules. But these herbalists, etc., uh, migrants that are showing, were they not part of the player's dwarf civ? Um, were they ever members? Uh, it's kind of hard to tell uh, without getting a list that I'm pulling from, if not. Um, but if it's happening, it's happening. The intended behavior is to not even have dwarf migrants from other civs, although, like others, they'd be allowed in the tavern, like visitors that could get in through a petition. So I, I think what this person has run into, this is me talking, what I think this person has run into is a problem where it's really hard to tell what factions they've been part of, because it says that they, they've, they've been part of a, bu a bunch of different groups in their description usually. So it's, it's possible that the person asking the question is misunderstanding how uh, they're, the, 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 the Dwarven history reading works from in-game, um, because as Tarn says, if they show up uh, and they're part of a different faction, they'll usually show up as part of a, a, a like, a, either as a mercenary or some sort of performance group, and they'll just hang out in the tavern and eventually petition for citizenship instead of just showing up in a migrant wave. That being said, who knows, it's Dwarf Fortress. On to the next one. This next one comes in as a follow-up in regarding intelligent uh, gremlins getting labors and jobs instead of simply being weird slave creatures that can talk. Uh, this comes in from Eric Blank, and they say, The game does, however, allow children of pets. If they were born intelligent to be assigned labors, rooms, and squads, and noble positions, etc. This includes them under the Citizens tab. I know because I use unintelligent pets in a rare case to give birth to a frequent cast of intelligent children to pump up my citizen count artificially. It is possible to enable the... Or, sorry, is it possible to enable these things on all pets that are intelligent? The game seems to already recognize them if they are born in your fort, but not tamed on sight or bought from a caravan. Gremlins and trolls brought from Embark by civs that allow them, and pets that gain intelligence through a syndrome of automatically self-assigning labors skill that they are skilled in, such as hauling and cleaning and construction labors. But UI elements to assign labors yourself never appear unless they are born into the fort and intelligent from birth, making them a citizen that carries the team tag around their whole life. So, from personal experience, it looks like a UI, a UI element not getting turned on and off rather than additional issues. Also, I've never seen gremlins do their mischievous thing once tamed. They, Whenever they've been brought on an embark or brought from a caravan or caught and tamed on site, they either do their default labors or hang out in meeting halls. I suspect something is broken here. And then Tarn's response is, It's not an easy change, sadly. A lot of places where the game checks for pet states or intelligence, and it, it, it just sort of assumes these things are exclusive. It'd be a big project, I think, to disentangle that, and a number of bugs and oddities would still be high, even if the interface were opened up. It's not clear what it means to have an intelligent pet, ethics-wise here, since dwarves don't do slaves. And the game uh, especially won't understand that syndrome since it uses, it, uh, it uses the creature type check too often when making certain decisions, especially in older code. Ideally, when, syn when the syndrome hits, uh, they'd be changed into a friend uh, or relationship or something. Uh, in relationships that are supposed to be deceptives, deceptive, uh, as the gremlin intended behavior is a wrinkle 
was another wrinkle that was added. So essentially, gremlins can become pseudo members of the fort uh, once they are tamed because they're supposed to be pets. But because they can speak and they're quote unquote intelligent, uh, theoretically, they could do the same jobs as dwarves in the fort. However, because they are an animal uh, this isn't really the case because they're designed to be pets. So it's like this weird kind of flip-floppy whether, whether or not Gremlins should be pets or not. I think that they should be able to be king of a faction, but that's just me. All hail Lord Gremlin. Gremlin from air. This next question is about cavalry and it comes in from Fantastic Dwarf. And they say, on the topic, uh, if animals as mounts and companions were to expect more scope in fortress mode and world generation as a whole, uh, examples are armies and dedicated cavalries, etc., uh, would the current distinction of historical figure animals logic end up being changed eventually to create historical non-historical uh, populations? Uh, examples. The named horses uh, and animals are found in stables, but all of the strays still linger around with a more even distribution on world generation of how animals are represented. Dwarves bonding with their mounts or giant house cats uh, choose who can ride on their backs. Uh, and then Tarn's response is... It seems that way. It already happens when there are slayer animals and they are historical when they are pets in fort mode. I think it'll just naturally follow uh, whatever features we add. This next question, which I actually get a lot in my comments section as well, uh, comes in from Quizumba, and they ask, is there by any chance uh, an option to add a force dig option? Uh, explanation, dig even if there is a damp location for our tiny dwarves. Sometimes I want to dig through an aquifer location without having to remake the tile to dig again. And Tarn says, this one is reasonably high up on our list of things to add to be handled in some way. It's probably even more annoying now that most of, aqu most of the aquifers can be managed without advanced techniques. So I would like to interject here and say I completely agree with this. However, I think that this is a feature that would probably cause some noobs to get very, 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 very angry. Uh, so I, I, I do still think there should be some form of warning uh, when you're digging, especially if you're if it's a new person playing the video game. That being said, uh, like the new aquifers are significantly less dangerous than lava, for example. So you know, let's like let's not be too silly here. So the next one comes in from Euthymer, and they say, In the S squad screen, using P to select individual dwarves for squads, uh, number 11 and higher never works. While it does work for squads 1 to 10, is there a thing on the radar to fix? Basically what they're saying is if you have more than 10 squads in your fortress, you cannot individually command dwarves in squads 11 and up. I actually ran into this once in a military surplus fortress. And then Tarn responds with, Whenever military squad menus end up turning into, I think this will stop being an issue just by virtue of the scope of the updates. So this is kind of a old problem that will be fixed in the near future just with the UI reworks. The next one is about the Steam version, also from Yuthmir, and it talks about Z-Levels, and they say, Will the new multi-Z-Level display be toggleable? Uh, can we turn it off and just to see one Z-Level at a time? I can picture myself turning it off briefly as a way to confirm what I'm seeing, especially with ramps and slopes, uh, fairly often until getting the hang of the new graphics. I completely agree with this, by the way. And then Tarn's response says, yeah, uh, Klinodef and F answered it here. We're going to have some settings and toggles at some point and uh, in-game rather than uh, over the D underscore init menu or whatever we'd, or wherever we'd normally hide it. So essentially there's going to be a lot of visual options to do with uh, Z-levels in the Steam version and you won't have to go digging through the game files to find the settings to change them. Holy fucking Luya. The next question is from the illustrious Mr. Underscore Crabman, and they say, Is the old development page accurate in that while it's probably incomplete and not in the planned order, is everything on it still planned to be done eventually? Or would some features be scrapped? And then Tarn responds with, Some of it is surely outdated now. And some are no longer priorities, which can be reached in the time we have left. But myth and magic stuff is more ambitious in some ways now, I think. And should it do a lot of it justice in, gen in a general sense? And then on to the society stuff after that. 
basically there's a lot of stuff on the to-do list on the Bay 12 website that is either ambitious or outdated, and the whole to-do list, I think, needs a refresh, personally. I would love to see a more uh, up-to-date version of it at some point, but, you know, one thing at a time. All right, this next one is a mouthful, so uh, buckle up, friends. The quote comes from Eurist McStatist, and they say, uh, when are we actually going to see festivals during gameplay? Question mark. And uh, two, sorry if this is too much of a suggestion, but I think it's kind of a bummer how coliseums and skulls on pedestals do nothing but give your people trauma, especially when you're playing a modded race like goblins. Are there any plans to change that in the near future? Maybe taking certain traits like cruelty into account? And are we going to see adventure mode AI improvements before the big wait? It's pretty silly how I can murder innocent villagers one by one, and all they do is cry and spit on me. 4. I remember you mentioned adoption being added in the near future. Is this still going to allow gay and asexual figures to get heirs? 5. Dungeon masters don't do much right now. What exactly are they planned to do once the villain update is over? Question mark? And six, the final question, are we going to get a more flexible magic system, i.e. systems that let you create your own spells? Oof, that's going to be a long answer. Then Tarn's response is... I think Fantastic Dwarf covered this well. I never have dates for anything anyways, and it isn't slotted in the shorter-term timeline on festivals and gameplay. Number two, no plans on the skulls and uh, distress, but uh, it is unsatisfying, I agree. Number three, I don't know what specifically will be addressed, but the adventure and investigation villains and army stuff comes before the big wait, so things will change. Four, the immediate concern with babies cr uh, was babies crawling into lava, so that would mean that the, in fort mode, uh, your monarch could potentially adopt and then pass their position on. In situations like that where it wasn't uh, a monarch that could p potentially adopt, or rather, I, I missed my line, in situations uh, like that where it wasn't a supported feature. But I'm not sure if it would happen in world gen at first, since it's harder to keep track of all of the orphans there that get sorted out with potential FPS trouble. But if it happens, it'll cover it, it'll cover everybody. Number five. They have an espionage token, so theoretically, they'd be enabling and be responsible for the player's shenanigans with the manager. It, it as with the manager, uh, it might be, it might not be much beyond that. Though, when we get into a situation of imperfect knowledge, in which we've already got with the Fort Heist situation, uh, suddenly what the dungeon master knows and doesn't know might be more important. But there's trouble here, since the player's interface on on the player's interface side, the dun if the dungeon master dies, it might be a bit difficult to delete all of the things you know. No, driving the player like to like pen and paper. So I think it'll take some feeling out as we go. Six. Uh, one of the main points of the Myth and Magic release is to get procedural magic systems, and these sorts of things are on the table. We all know the spellmaker from Elder Scrolls, and there's also systems like Spellcraft where you can change up amounts of regents to get a variable levels and either prep or on the fly, and perhaps most ambitiously systems from literature and myth, where effects and powers are more freeform, like I can create and control water to do whatever with it. Those will be some of the harder things to capture and create interfaces for, and mechanics for, etc. But we're hoping to not just be bound by the idea of discrete spells in the usual way, that sometimes it would function differently. That is a very long one. Uh, hopefully that was all coherent. On to the next one. This question is from Lord L, and they say, What if players will have some limited access to legends right during their fortress and adventure runs that, they, that will only allow viewing of events that are known to the player? This would, be a, this would really bring joy of discovery and some order to the information you know, especially useful in adventure mode. I completely agree with this, but I think I know what the answer is going to be. 
The knowledge issue is tricky, says Tarn, as the di as in the replies, but there is some reasonable level that can be shown, even in fortress mode without spoiling things, just to make use of the added intricacy of world gen provise, provides. We've been thinking about this again lately, since it's the whole thing, uh, since it's a whole thing sitting there uh, that isn't really used. When I do the new Legends hyperlinks typeface stuff, uh, we'll see if something happens in fort mode. Adventure mode is a whole other critter, and we haven't done enough work there to say, but it's reasonable to say that you should know what everybody knows about the bigger issues. It would be amazing, in my personal opinion, to just get a hyperlink as part of a historical figure on an artifact or something that would give you some more information. Like if 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 they implement hype once they implement implement hyperlinks for the Steam version, if when you see an artifact, uh, it would be amazing to just like say, oh, this historical figure. Why is this so historical figure important? And then just read that historical figure's history. I would love that. I don't know if we'll get any of that. Like all of this is you know still question mark work in progress stuff. But geez, that would be so cool. This next one is about dwarves' jobs and work priorities coming from Patrick Lundell. And they say, I don't understand how the, quote, but the jobs will be done by anybody that is available, starting with, uh, with the most talented, quote, uh, can work unless most of the workforce is unassigned to any, air quotes, real job. In the current system, dwarves select posted jobs as they become available for new jobs, unless unoccupied when the job is posted. Without changes to that logic, the talented dwarves will almost always get the next job in a workshop taken by somebody else, unless the current, air quotes, finished job, and then they wander away for 10 steps before taking a new one, behavior is changed so that dwarves now either kick the unskilled out or grab the next job immediately. Any comments on how this will work? On the positive side, does the need for satisfaction factor into the job selection process at all? So, such that those who desperately want to craft something get a higher priority than the usual riffraff? Also, I just want to add in, I love the word riffraff. People need to say that more. Tarn's response is, without using masters in the details, we've found that does it still that does still sort of function the cluster of dwarves that are already good at the job from the varied migrant pool tend to work on them and get better at them but it is a bit of a delay in the job postings that uh, gives the better dwarves a chance to appear i haven't seen this 10 steps wander behavior screw things up it is confusing that they wouldn't be up for the next application since they are free the next time applications are processed, uh, but if, that, if that's a known bug, it hasn't impacted the game's skill breakdowns much, I, but I'd probably want to take a look at it. At the same time, assigning workshop masters is really easy and is what we intend for jobs you want done well. So essentially what, what, what Tarn's saying, or, or what, what, what they're saying is, currently the, when a dwarf finishes a job, they will just like stop what they're doing and walk away and do something else and in a world where we're more uh dedicated to auto labor instead of specifically assigned labor instead of um assigning jobs to like the whole crowd we're going to be more like putting one dwarf in charge of this uh workshop this dwarf in charge charge of this workshop which is actually a system i almost never use it it is as tarn says quite easy to set up it's, i just find it a little bit finicky in the current ui so i almost never use it so i actually forget that, that feature exists that being said um it would be kind of nice to see them pick up jobs quicker after they finish their previous job i think what we're actually getting here is that dwarves act need a, a longer break in between jobs you know like who wants to work for five days on making a craft and then not getting to take 10 steps break now this next question is about embark sizes and it comes from a uh 98 and they say what is the biggest embark size that you expect to be stable by the 1.0 release do you think it might be greater than the current maximum size of 16 by 16. And Tarn's response is, of course. Currently, it gives you a warning for 16 by 16 if, uh, if that's not guaranteed to be stable. And even ones smaller than that give you the warning. Part of the idea of the map rewrite is to handle altitudes a little better. So that will, that'll allow us to do the multi-camera battlefield thing. 
so that you can watch a battle in some other part of the map while your fortress is going, even on a large battlefield. Because it doesn't load the 100 plus Z layers below generally, there's not a lot of wrinkles there. Though it remains to be seen how fast it'll actually be, and which sizes that will be allowed by default. We're not precisely aiming for larger and larger forts though. So just to be clear, when they say 1.0, I think they mean like when game is done, 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 not the Steam version, just so that there's no confusion there. The next one comes in from Eurist McOverused Joke, and they say, There are goals other than immortality that are valid for secrets, given that they currently do nothing, unlike the immortality goal. Are there any other plans to make these functional after slash during the myth and magic arc? Or are they some sort of placeholders for something bigger? Or maybe a placeholder for some kind of primitive magic system? I don't know. I, I, I don't want to build any unrealistic expectations for myself, but the hype train is real. Chugga 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 choo choo. That was my own editorial right there. And Tarn's response is, when you say after slash during the myth and magic stuff, during that arc, we're hoping for way more than primitive, air quotes, magic systems. And we're going for full procedural robust magic systems. The goal of the system will hopefully be more integrated with regular personality stuff during this. So this next one comes in from Frank Ville, and they say, if hospitals are now a location, does that mean that we will see hospitals in different parts of the world, both in adventure mode and in world gen? Or will that have to wait for later? I didn't even think about that. The infrastructure uh, is all there now, says Tarn, but it'll have to wait. Uh, we're pretty much trying to point straight towards the release now, and there's a lot left to do. This next one comes in from user, quote, unintelligent. I didn't tell them that, they named themselves that. Uh, and they say, my biggest concern with the new labor system is that it addresses the opposite of my own concerns. The new labor system allows you to easily prevent uh, non-stone crafters from doing stone crafting jobs. I don't mind if a low skill stone crafters do stone crafting, but what I really want is for miners to only mine and not do any other jobs. With the new labor system, there is an easier, is there an easier way to prevent miners from doing non-mining? jobs other than making every work detail selected dwarves only uh, other than assigning every dwarf that isn't a miner to not mining skill and work details tarn responds with you can set your miners to, uh, and other work detail people to specialize just like you can with workshop masters and then your miners will only mine and not haul or do any other jobs so currently just one click per miner and they are arranged nicely at the top of the work detail when they are selected now and you can make specialized haulers in the same way it also works for doctors and other location occupants if you want to keep them on duty you can also use custom work details to turn off specific labors entirely uh, by making, uh, example, a stone hauling work detail and then setting it to nobody does this if you want stone to remain in place after you mine without having to fiddle too much. I would like to interject here momentarily and just state that uh, some dwarves uh, get really bored if all you let them do is minor haul, and I wonder if there are going to be a lot of players running into this problem with this new work system, because I, I know this is more relevant in older versions of the game and not so relevant in the current version of the game, but as stress fluctuates and changes, I wonder if there will be a point where suddenly a lot of dwarves are getting very upset because all that they're doing is mining. Well, I mean, wouldn't you be bored shitless? I know I would be. This next one comes in from Sue, and they say, Hi, Tody. Bit of an unusual question today. I've been watching and reading this talk from 2020 at the virtual roguelike celebration on hash functions instead of using RAND uh, to randomly decide things. So that RNG calls won't be affected by earlier calls. It's very interesting. Does Dwarf Fortress do anything like this already? Or have you considered this technique? We recall there... We recall there being something in one of the update posts a while back that sounded like you were suffering from this problem. And then Tarn responds with, I'm not sure which update post you're talking about, but it is a common problem. I was at that roguelike talk, well, virtually, and uh, almost immediately 
tie, tried out the split max stuff, and it is fast and fun. I haven't used most the more advanced place keeping and skipping parallel abilities of it, but I've used it for more procedural furniture variations and some map variation stuff, and it works really well where uh, our regular twister would be slower at, to seed and where I would be having trouble seeding more simple RNGs without glaring artifacts popping up. We do use multiple seeds, etc. in world gen with the twister, and it puts seeds on the stack sometimes to keep things constant. And it makes de a debugging debugging messy sometimes when there are bugs in world gen uh, consistency. I haven't revisited any of that yet, but there are doubtless lots of places where switching to the new one will make it cleaner and less prone to errors. I'll be completely honest, I only understood about half of that. Uh, I hope that you got more out of it than I did. The next question comes in from Lethosaur, and they say, Are you planning to upgrade DF to SDL2, or has that happened already? Question mark. And Tarn's response is, I haven't done it yet, and things are working well enough so far, it hasn't seemed pressing. It's something I'd like to try because it might speed things up or give me more powers, but if it throws a month-long wrench into the process right now, it doesn't look like I should do that. Uh, I should leave it uh, for a time when I'm not under pressure, whatever that means, but this is not it. Um, as more testing happens on more setups and we're closer to the finish line, that might change. Now to end things off with a wall of text from Mr. Underscore Crabman, and they say, What changes, if any, do you have planned for the likes of combat report logs and the block of text describing creatures' current injuries? Question mark For the Steam release, that is. For the dragon slash constructed randomizer, do you have any idea how this stage, how this, how to, at this stage, how descriptions would work? Currently, descriptions for most creatures are manually entered into the RAWs for proc gen creatures to follow a hard corded form format for certain bodily traits and abilities. But if dragon variations are to be exposed in the RAWs, presumably just one description couldn't cover all possible dragons without being extremely vague. But hard-coded means uh, of generating descriptions seem a bit tricky to pull off in terms of how to neatly describe important features without describing too much. In a bland manner, i.e. being too anatomical or clinical or repetitive and lacking in flavor like many of the manual descriptions we currently have. Especially if the constrained randomizing functionality isn't tied to dragons is and is expanded to other creatures. To an extent, this also applies to other proc gen stuff planned to be exposed to manipulate in the raws at a later point in some way. And because of how myth and magic and a lot more creatures in the world may potentially be randomly generated. Edit. Some sort of question also goes with uh, preface strings. Uh, I don't know what that means. And also, why is it that only integers seem to be used in the raws for everything? I don't think any numbers use decimal points as far as I can tell. Whew. And Tarn's response is... I'm not sure combat reports are going to change. They need to be integrated with the announcement icons that roll up on the left side, and we have some space left for that. Next, uh, procedural text is always difficult, especially getting it to sound varied and natural while still being accurate. There are various tools and so forth and other projects and people have done. Uh, example are Trincentry and Markov stuff and G GPT, uh, etc. And I'm not sure which direction we'll end up going. It's not an easy problem and our initial descriptions will be lacking, I'm sure. And then last, uh, part he said, yes, as Partek Lund... Pa Why do I always want to say Partek? Patrick Lundale uh, mentioned there is an example of general speed concerns. Um, I got to prefer a fixed math uh, when doing triangle UV chords before DirectX existed. On some ancient pre armok projects that lean even more that and lean even more that way now. Uh, on top of speed travel, doing file IO with floating points is also a pain compared to integers. I just try to never use them outside of the necessary local calculations that have no chance of ever being serialized. 
Mainly, I can't escape using examples sin slash cos, or I need a real sqrt and square won't suffice. Example, distance and comparisons, comparing lots of letters and uh symbols I don't understand. It's <laughs> faster than also taking SQRT and comparing after. Raws aren't binary serialization, and I can understand for appearances sake why doing uh, e.g. distances as uh, something centimeters cubed would be preferable, but I generally... But generally, I can just push to MC, MG, or CC, whatever is close enough to get rid of the period. So it matches the internal data structures. So I don't have to parse the period and period. And it's good for the raws to virtually match the data. Here in Future of a Fortress, we just had that issue with the out of 10 volume conversion causing some confusion. And it would probably be better to just use those unusual units out in the raws as well, rather than converting silently. Once again, I understood almost none of that. I hope you got more out of it than I did. But uh, that is this month's uh, me talking over the future of the Fortress posts. If you would like to take part in these conversations, the forums are public and there is a link in the description. And if you uh, want to yell at me about how poorly I read some of these, you can do that down in the description or beneath the description in the comments section. Or if you just want to comment on any of the things that were discussed here, you can do that as well. Uh, there will be more DF updates in the future. And uh, please go support Bay 12 games if you are waiting for the Steam edition to come out, because seriously, that's what all of us have been doing for years, and it's what lets them take their time instead of having to force out updates that aren't finished. Patience is a virtue, and we'll all get there around the same time. Don't worry. This game will come out in a more reasonable time frame than I think that a lot of you are expecting at this point. Lastly, if you would like to support these videos and these updates that I do on Dwarf Fortress as well as the live streams that I do, I have a Patreon. You can see the names of the people who support me here on the screen currently. Thank you very much to them for supporting me and allowing me to do this full time as my weird job thingy. And thank you for watching as always, and I'll see you in the next one.